Local governing board members in the audience, you wouldn't have done it because it's local governing boards that do it. It's your town board or village board of trustees that would adopt the moratorium law. Yeah. So it sounds like not not a lot recently. All right. So a land use moratorium is a local enactment that temporarily suspends a landowner's right to obtain development approvals while the municipality chooses to make a considers and potentially adopts changes to their own land use laws um, or updates its comprehensive plan to address new circumstances that your previous uh, comprehensive plan or land use regulations or zoning code hasn't hasn't looked at before so a lot of times we see land use moratoriums being enacted for something that you've never seen in your community before. So a lot of times recently, this it used to be maybe 10 years ago, it was wind moratoriums or wind energy facilities. But recently, it's been things like cryptocurrency could also send people into a moratorium. And that's for communities that uh, get their power from uh, the New York Power Authority if they sit on, um, if they have some kind of hydroelectric plant. Cryptocurrency at its height, you needed a lot of energy to mine, Bitcoin mine, and so people were flocking to those communities with cheap power and gobbling up all that, that power, the cheap power, to essentially, um, you know, try to make it rich on Bitcoin. So talk about, I think a lot of local governments, things tend to be reactionary. So talk about that coming to your to your community, like this is for like Plattsburgh or Rouse's Point. Imagine having that where you've been like always having cheap energy. So everybody heats with electric because it's so cheap. And imagine that supply going away. What are you going to do? So. That's something that your zoning law definitely doesn't doesn't look at, doesn't talk about at all. So that's where you would adopt a moratorium. So it gives the municipality an opportunity to take a breath and decide, okay, where are we going to go from here? So let's think about, um, you know, what kind of regulations can we put in place uh, to try to make it. Um, trying to make good uh, land use regulations for the future with, in regards to this issue. Another one we'll see is sometimes if there's some kind of pollution, like water pollution, a local governing board might consider having a moratorium because you don't want to have a lot of building happening in a place where um, you know there might be water contamination or other issues. So. Um, Essentially, you're just, the moratorium uh, allows the status quo or preserves the status quo while the municipality just figures out what they're going to do. And uh, there are two types. The most common that we see is land use, but there is also a general police power, which Chris will talk about. And essentially, it is a local law or ordinance that, again, temporarily suspends a landowner's right to obtain development approvals, and it addresses circumstances not addressed by your current laws. So a lot of times it's energy regulation, but it can also be things like Airbnb pressures, short-term rental pressure in your market could also have like a damaging impact to 
uh, the housing stock in your community, especially if um, there's a lot of people who are struggling to find rental apartments in your community. Um, and essentially, again, you're taking that breath to consider your revisions to your comprehensive plan or your land use regulations. And um, it's not mentioned anywhere in statute. The whole idea of moratoria has played out in the court systems. And the landmark moratorium case is Downing versus Alexandria that paved the way for land use moratoria. And I'm not going to read the whole thing, but essentially it's just saying you want to preserve the status quo because if not, uh, and people get into, if they know that you're going to change your regulations and people start all of a sudden developing in ways that would go against what your future zoning code would be, it's like locking the stable after the horse is stolen. So essentially, you're just taking that pause to allow yourself to take a breath. It doesn't last forever. In fact, moratorium should be very short in duration, from like three to six months in duration. Um, but you're just kind of figuring out where are you going to take the next steps. And a lot of times, a lot of municipalities need that time to pull together something like a comprehensive plan update. Like, how many of you, by a show of hands, have updated your comprehensive plan in like the last five years? <laughs> okay, so, so that's something like you might want to go back and take a look because all of a sudden there's some kind of, you know, you're feeling a pressure of some kind of, you know, it could be an employer or it could be uh, there's changing demographics in your community, like maybe um, retirees are leaving your community and so are young people. <coughs> You know, these are ideas that you would do and say, like, maybe we should take a look at our comprehensive plan and also take a look at our regulations to make sure everything is aligned. The general police power moratorium is for immediate health and safety crises. And again, as Paula said, most moratoria have to do with land use. Even the police power moratoria often concern issues that are related to land use, but their courts will hold local governments that pass the police power moratoria to a higher standard. The and there there are three versus I believe the five for land use moratoria, but in the in the case of the general police power. The municipality must justify the temporary measures. The moratoria are temporary in nature. They shouldn't be enacted just to kick the can down the road and put off the inevitable, inevitable being the development that's proposed or restricting the development that's proposed. If you don't have the votes for the restriction, maybe you have the votes for a moratorium, and that's not the way to solve the problem. But the local government must have acted in response to a dire necessity. And in, I know, one case, it was an incinerator that was proposed. And the town didn't have zoning, and the incinerator, it's a land use in nature, but they considered it a dire necessity. In another one, it was, uh, and this one was overturned a few <coughs> years ago, there, uh, there were a number of local governments passing moratorium laws against fracking, hydrofracking. It wasn't really clear what level, what ability local governments would have to regulate hydrofracking. And to, to, it turns out they can, it turns out we don't have it in the state, but even before it was restricted statewide, it was, there was a, a case that went up to the Court of Appeals that said that a town that restricts mining, the, the, um, uh, the uh, oil, gas, and solution mining law was the same as the aggregate mining law. I, I forget exactly what that's called. But the, they read exactly the same. So a local government, it turns out, can restrict mining to a certain area or ban it townwide. 
down it, ban it for the entire municipality. But before that was widely acknowledged, there were a number of local governments saying, we need a moratorium law on fracking. And they weren't passing restrictions, they were passing moratorium laws and just, just passing them uh, over and over again. And there was one challenge in the city of Binghamton where it, it passed, the city of Binghamton passed a police power moratorium. Uh, and we'll go through the other questions and then I'll tell you why it was overturned. The action is calculated to alleviate or prevent a crisis condition. So it's got to be about to happen. Dire necessity and uh, reasonably calculated. So the, the moratorium is passed in order to uh, reduce that likelihood to, in response to a, dis, a dire necessity and to alleviate the problem. To, to, uh, and then it has to, and this is very important, it goes for land use also, it's taking steps to fix that problem. And in the case of the city of Binghamton, there, there was not a, the court said there's not a dire necessity because the state hasn't, doesn't even have a permit structure for hydrofracking and you're passing this moratorium law to the, there was no mining allowed in the city, so it was already kind of restricted. And three, the city had passed that moratorium and wasn't doing anything to change its laws. It turns out it didn't have to. So these are important things to remember. If something comes before you, you've got to follow the laws, and as Paula probably said, there, there's no statutory rule for passing moratorium laws. It's all in case law. And we have a publication called Land Use Moratoria that she probably mentioned. When she was talking about it, I was probably over getting them from the, from the student lounge. So the, we have just a few handouts, a few copies of the publications. They're on that front table now. So if you want a copy of Land Use Moratoria, the order form. There's one more copy of the Guide to Planning and Zoning Laws and then Adopting Local Laws in New York State. Grab a copy. So uh, there, uh, here's a, a ca another case, this is in the Land Use Moratoria publication, that involved the um, Bell Harbor Realty versus Kerr. The local government passed a, a general police power moratorium to prevent and revoked a building permit that had already been granted because the sewer system, it was discovered, was not able to handle that new development. And the Court of Appeals, the highest state court, upheld this particular passage of the moratorium law as a legitimate exercise of the general police power and um, said it's not limited to the constraints of zoning authority. So the, um, the, the village went ahead and um, increased its sewer capacity in order to uh, provide for that additional development to be put online. There are other cases, there, there are three different cases in the publication and I sometimes get them mixed up that involve inadequate sewerage capacity. And in this one, the village did the right thing. In another one, the village did the wrong thing, and it, it eventually got overturned. So um, moratoria, just a, a general summary of the reasons for having moratorium laws. Uh, Paula talked a little bit about this uh, in her introduction. It's to prevent rush development, a race to development, uh, it, it, a race to either pass the law or put the permit in and get and achieve vested rights. It's been upheld, moratorium laws, even in that very first case, the Alexandria, Virginia case, and then in other New York cases. In, in, in New York cases, the courts have said, even in one in particular, where the procedures weren't followed, but the court said moratoria are important, is an, a land use moratorium is an important tool 
to prevent inefficient and ill-conceived growth, unplanned growth. It's a means, it's a, it's a tool for good planning. And decisions that are, the, that race to development could have disadvantages to property owners and the community at large into the future. So, uh, and, and uh, again, consistency with the comprehensive plan. If you have an older comprehensive plan, if you're going to be working on the comprehensive plan, if it needs to be updated, if you don't have a comprehensive plan and you need one, the moratorium, being able to pass a moratorium law enable, gives you that time to put your, to get your laws into shape. I was talking to somebody during the break who told me his village's laws are way out of date and if they had some challenging uh, new proposals that weren't envisioned 20 years ago or 30 years ago or how, however long ago it's been that those laws have been updated, there, there, would be a, there would be a lot of conflict in that development. Reasons not to pass moratorium laws are to slow down development, and I brought this up just a few minutes ago, in hopes that the developer goes away. Just there not being quite enough political will to restrict a certain kind of development. And we're seeing a lot of solar proposals now. The, there, I, I think there are a lot of municipalities, and, and if you don't have to raise your hand if you're, yours is one of them, because I hear this all over the state. There are a lot of municipalities that said, oh, well, you, they, they didn't have solar in their lawns. But when somebody wanted to put solar on the roof or just one or two panels in the backyard, the local government didn't want to stand in their way. They said, oh, that's not going to bother anyone. Yeah, yeah, you can do that. But they didn't actually change their law. Now we're seeing larger proposals, and local governments aren't ready for them necessarily. So they're, they're passing moratorium laws to get their, to get their permanent laws into shape uh, to, to, to revise them. Now, they could have revised them a few years ago, like the, the case with fracking. Like in, uh, with fracking, the, the state hadn't passed, the state didn't have a means of a, enabling fracking. So the local governments, instead of passing moratorium laws, could have just used that time to decide where or if they wanted to allow fracking. Halting development while uh, the community considers buying land. That's, that's, not another, that's another reason, and that happened, that very thing happened in this case, Oakwood Island Yacht Club versus the city of New Rochelle. The city of New Rochelle actually granted site plan approval to a developer and passed a moratorium law that prevented the development from proceeding and meanwhile tried to apply for a grant from the state to buy the land to turn it into a park. So that, and somehow in the case, like I, I kind of wondered reading, I didn't read the actual case, I read the summary to, to prepare today. And uh, some of these cases I, I have read a few times to, to really understand them. But this one I thought to myself, how did the court know that the city was going to buy the land. Maybe the city probably made it, was, was overt in saying the reason we passed the moratorium law was to buy the land. I, I think one of the reasons for executive session, we had the conversation about executive session, if a municipality wants to buy land, that's something to go into executive session about because you don't want other people or the property owners knowing ahead of time and preparing by inflating the value of the land and, and inflating the price. So this, is, this was a case where it was the very opposite, that the city was overt in its intentions to buy the land, and that's why it put the, uh, the moratorium law on the development. But, but the, the more, and that's a really unusual circumstance, the much more common um, overturning of moratorium laws is when there isn't the political will to actually pass the law to say, no, you can't do this thing, but there are enough votes for the moratorium, they just keep, they pass the moratorium, and then they extend it, and they keep extending it, and they never actually revise their zoning, 
and eventually the developer challenges the moratorium and uh, is often successful. We have a couple cases later on uh, that deal with that. So for growth capping laws, the um, I don't know how many municipalities actually do growth capping laws. Not too many, and growth is slow in this part of the state, so it wouldn't really apply here, but just so. But anyways, yeah. the landmark case uh, for growth capping laws is Golden versus the town of Ramapo in Rockland County. And it was decided in 1972, and essentially the court upheld the town's uh, phased, 18-year phased development uh, plan, which essentially placed restrictions on certain parts of the town for development uh, until uh, a developer would want to come in and provide for uh, some of the capital improvement upgrades. So they would lift the restrictions if a developer came before the town and said, okay, I want to do a subdivision, but I'm going to also upgrade the sewer and I'm going to lay down um, uh, water lines and uh, I'm going to improve the drainage and I'm also going to build you the roads that go in and out of the subdivision and we'll make sure that we put some money on the side so you have a fire department for a firehouse for that area of town as well. So um, that, however, is different than a moratorium because by contrast, it's just designed to halt development for a certain period of time, whereas growth cap laws essentially just kind of do it in a more, in a slower pace just to make sure that you're providing the needed, um, you know, public infrastructure as you do it. And Rockland County, if you are not aware of it, was a county that was rapidly developing in the 1970s at that time. So it was kind of considered one of the more important land use cases for planners because it kind of put it out there that we don't have to just open the gates and let everybody just develop wherever they want you can kind of think a little bit more strategically about uh, where you want to see development occur in your municipality. I think Clifton Park has some growth capping measure at this point. And then, of course, the update to Rockland County is this Golden versus the town of Ramapo is a really important, like, textbook case. But now the town of Ramapo is growing fast once again, and it's... Um, the growth capping measures are not really being adhered to yeah. from what we gather. So, once you decide to do uh, put in place a moratorium, it <clears throat> can uh, affect the acceptance of new land use applications. You can decide if you're going to accept them or not. Uh, projects currently before review boards. A lot of people think that just because they got their application in, they're grandfathered into the review process, but that's not necessarily the case. We do get a lot of questions about that. Mm -hmm. uh, the issuance of permits, and that's not just like area or use fair or building permits, but it's building, it's sign permits, water and sewer connections. The establishment of certain businesses, like adult uses or junkyards, mining. Mining can be a really hot button issue for a lot of communities across New York State. And of course, the siting of certain uses, like solid waste facilities. If you've been paying attention to the news, um, you know, the, we're kind of coming up on some crisis mode about recyclables and the fact that. Uh, China is not really taking our um, recycled plastics anymore. So I feel like the next kind of major crisis for local governments to deal with is really what do you do with your garbage? And it's an incredibly expensive uh, you know, process in trying to figure out where you're going to send it to, or are you going to start a new you know, landfill? And of course, siting those landfills is really difficult because if there's homeowners that live around it or there's schools that are around it, you might not want to have a landfill, you know, where it's downwind to a school and they can smell, you know, whatever is going on. 
So those are things that you know a lot of us think like you just throw it away and somebody comes and it you know and the garbage disappears, but you know where does it go? And this is big money for a lot of municipalities. A lot of municipalities that have landfills balance their budgets by taking garbage of other municipalities, but then realize like we're losing space really rapidly. So what are we going to do when it's capped out? <coughs> And then, of course, you can build exemptions into your moratorium as well. And a lot of times you'll see them exempt uh, certain activities like construction applications that have begun, that are approved and begun, uh, even where the rights are not necessarily vested. Uh, construction of single family or sometimes two family homes. Uh, minor expansions or additions to buildings, that's like if somebody's coming before you for a garage permit or maybe a small accessory dwelling or something. Um, and projects under review, such as subdivision applications that have already received a preliminary uh, approval. <coughs> Are you this one or is this one you? Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> So for subdivision, you want to make sure that you're, um, and this is for our planning board members in the room, that the worry of the default approval. So you're giving a statutory prescribed timeline. So you want to make sure that whatever you do, um, you want to make a decision within the 62 days of the close of the hearing, or you'll end up with a default approval. So moratorium can suspend your subdivision applications and can delay action beyond those time frames. Um, but in your moratorium, you need to state if you are superseding the default approval provision. And the biggest thing I can tell you to take away from this course is you want to make sure that your municipal attorney looks at a possible moratorium and very carefully and make sure that you're following the statutory guidelines. Because a lot of times, moratorium, you're actually going to supersede a whole bunch of state statutes. So you want to make sure that you're quoting them all correctly and that somebody takes a look at it and knows what they're doing exactly. Because it could be you miss one minor little part of, or you quote, misquote the, the super, which statute you're going to supersede, and it could be thrown out if it's challenged. So um, this is where that land use moratorium uh, is really important, but also uh, we have the adopting local laws as well, because these are adopted by local laws, and if you don't know, local laws don't become effective until they're filed at the Department of State. So you want to make sure that you're you know, crossing your T's and dying your I's. Good thinking to have brought that publication as well. Yeah. Question. So. Yes. If the board goes through and grants a moratorium, is that overridable in the case of a village by the trustees and mayor? Say that again? Say the, the planning board the, sets the moratorium. Is that an overridable uh, by so, the trustees? So it's uh, the only per the only board that can uh, vote for a moratorium is your governing board. Okay, so, so we don't. They right. Don't. Yeah. Okay. So you can, you can suggest it, it okay. to your board, saying like, "Okay, we're getting a bunch of applications for solar, and we don't know what to do because there's nothing in our laws that say anything about it." So it might be our best bet to implement a moratorium on tier three projects, so solar projects, so we can figure out, you know, what part of a model law we might use to update our zoning code. So it can be just task specific. Yeah. We can move on with every other business, just that one area. Yeah, so you could literally keep taking applications. It could be business as usual for the most part for you. Except for that one second. Except for solar applications that are coming mm -hmm. before you. But if somebody comes to the ZBA for a lot line adjustment, then sure, go yeah. ahead. Okay. It doesn't have to be on all development, although as we'll discuss in a few minutes, it shouldn't be, you should avoid placing it on one property. Mm -hmm. So if only one person is proposing a 15-acre solar farm, 
you 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 can say we're passing a moratorium law on solar and the result will be that it's only that person but if there are a couple solar farms and you're passing a moratorium law just on one location that's obviously targeted at one in individual or property owner or developer now we do have a certain situation where we are trying to do that with one section mm -hmm. not i mean there's several without giving all the examples away mm -hmm. with, or the specifics right what we're trying to do is change the laws well update the laws <laughs> and the two sites that are coming to us and asking to develop one was in existence many, many years ago, oh. is no longer in existence, but now wants to re restart. Restart, yeah. Does that fall under a grandfather law, or does it become, because now the Board of Health has to get involved as well, because oh. what they want to do. And we just want to it sounds like you should treat them the same way. Same way. Yeah. Say, starting yeah. from fresh. Right. Here's yeah. the law. Because it's, it, if the one is out of it's not in business at the moment, no, hasn't it, been it hasn't been for years. a long time, then they should both be treated the same way. Same way. Mm -hmm. okay. Both be treated as new. And, and, and same thing, like even if you were worried about um, an environment, if, if you were worried about a specific problem um, that would result, well, solar, the character of the community, there, that's really the, the negative of, of well, they're they're really two. If if they're really large scale, it's taking land out of land out of agriculture, arguably, and then there's the aesthetics. So taking land out of agriculture and the uh, the change of the character of the community. Just to stick with the solar example, it should be shared by everyone. Just pass a moratorium law on solar or on the. Um, creation of the business that you're referring to so treat yeah treat them the same if you if you could get into trouble the, the singling somebody yeah. out sing, singling one out and not the other this is just to say there's a, an attorney general's informal opinion that even though it's inconsistent with general law the local government that undertakes rezoning <laughs> May in a, that's working on rezoning, working on amending its zoning regulations, may enact a moratorium on the granting of use variances by the Zoning Board of Appeals. And uh, that's not something that any of us would know. In fact, I, I, I was telling Paul, it's been a long time since I've taught this course, so I had to kind of teach it to myself again, and I'd totally forgotten about this. So, uh, you know when you teach it, you forget some of this stuff. So, um, Making your law, laws legally defensible, making your moratorium laws legally defensible. In one of the cases that we'll talk about a little later, Charles versus Diamond, there was a, a line from the court that I just wanted to share uh, to highlight the, the difficulty of knowing exactly what it might be that a court will find a problem with. Although generally, if you follow these you follow these rules, you should be okay. No single factor by itself controls the determination of whether a particular municipal action is reasonable. So that, what that really means is that every situation has to be looked at in its context. Like you can't just pass, you can't, uh, there, there aren't sweeping, gen you can't make sweeping generalizations. Every circumstance has to be looked at in its own context and how the reasons for it by the local government and what's, what's being, uh, what the goal is. So the five key elements, we went over the three for the general police power. These are the five for the land use moratorium. So it's a little less dire and emergency crisis response than the general police power. There has to be a reasonable time frame relative to the action being addressed, and we're going to go over each of these in greater detail. Uh, and actually, I'm not going to read this to you. It's, it, we'll, we'll go over all of them in greater detail. 
obviously there has to be a public purpose. And um, the, uh, the third one goes to the question that we just talked about with the two properties, that the burden has to be shared by the public and not just imposed on one. Paula mentioned the, the strict uh, adherence to adoption procedures and the expiration. So reasonable time frame. It must be relatively short. And Paula mentioned this earlier, I think, too. It, it shouldn't be years long. It should be months long. Even if it's a complicated, you can always extend it and demonstrate that you're working to update your local laws and not just, not just hoping it'll go away. But specify the duration and the, make sure you have plenty of evidence that you're working on it. Minutes of your planning board meetings, communication between the planning board and the town board, and um, maybe the, the update to the comprehensive plan. Maybe you've established a small committee to update the comprehensive plan. So uh, those all, um, those should all be part of that first, that first criterion. After all that we've told you about these should be Year, these should be months long, not years long. You can probably look at those lengths of time on the left and say, what were they thinking? Seven years for a comprehensive plan and draft zoning? They're crazy. Five years for a local waterfront revitalization? <coughs> uh, that's, that's supposed to be program. I just caught that. Local, local waterfront revitalization program. It's like a plan, but they're, some of our colleagues in the yeah, former division, the you do. But they, some of them, a few of the ones who were real sticklers about this have left, but they emphasize it's a program. And that was on Long Island. The two of these were, uh, were uh, the, the Rockville Center's on Long Island. The one Mitchell versus Kemp, I'm not sure where that was. And five years for a new zoning law and master, master plan, comprehensive plan, that's too long too, the court said. More reasonably, two years for a win law that was um, given an extension, and it was a, it was a, because it's a highly technical, and it was an early adopter, I believe. It was early when, in the last, uh, in the wind rush, there there's some wind development proposed for Lewis County. Now it, it, it's the it's in the article ten, right? Right, Frank. It's yeah. that's wind and solar. But 20 years ago, when we got the wind up the hill, this case was uh, was during that rush for wind energy out in western New York. And one year for the adjustment of zoning, the amendment of zoning, in response to lots of big box development of retail. And the court found that reasonable. So. Uh, you can't go wrong with six months that you uh, extend as needed. And of course, your local law should serve a valid public purpose. And um, so some examples would be a town that's facing unprecedented growth after the announcement of a chip fabrication plant, which happens in Saratoga County. Uh, a new commercial businesses are unsightly and distracting from the pristine view. Remember, aesthetics is also part of the general police powers. So, um, you know, if you're seeing something's moving in that's going to distract from, you know, your beautiful community and you know it, like I think about outside this building, it's beautiful. Yeah. Um, you know, you might want to make sure that whatever uses are coming might not, um, you know, take away from the enjoyment of that. Or if a town is waiting for environmental study results, like if there might be a pollution issue, a water pollution issue, or air pollution issue, uh, and you just are waiting for results to kind of make the next step from there. And again, we talked about this briefly, balancing the community benefit and detriment. So the municipality should be prepared to show that the burden imposed by the moratorium is being shared substantially by the public at large, as opposed to a minority of landowners. 
And like Chris said before, this is from the Court of Appeals decision of Charles versus Diamond, uh, which dealt with restrictions on residential sewer connections. And there is a quote, the crucial factor and perhaps even the decisive one is whether the ultimate economic cost of the benefit is being shared by members of the community at large or rather is being hidden from the public by the placement of the entire burden upon a particular property owner. So essentially, if you're going to do this, make sure that everybody is feeling the pain, the pinch of not being able to do anything for a couple of months collectively. And so, again, you'll be developing or amending your comprehensive plan or your zoning regulations or maybe site plan or subdivision. And a lot of times this falls back to making those improvements to your road system or water or sewer infrastructure, which we know are aging across both of New York State, so uh, you know you want to definitely be um, sure that whatever is being installed or upgraded is being um, done the best way possible, and will uh, you know stand the test of time. And of course, like I said before, the strict adherence to procedures. You need to cite one of the two sources of authorization while you follow your procedures. So it's the local law adoption under the general police power, that's municipal home rule, uh, statute 20 through 27, or you're amending the zoning by local law or ordinance. And they say um, the best way of handling a moratorium based on land use and your zoning is to treat it like an amendment to your zoning law in existence. And time certain for expiration, again, you don't want to keep these going on and on and on forever. Uh, the courts will frown upon you if you are challenged. Uh, make sure that it's unreasonable. Like we said, three to six months is usually about that golden time. And start it for three to six and you realize like we're really in the thick of this and we're going to need a little bit more time because we are, you know, halfway through our comprehensive plan update. That's when you just extend the law again and essentially say, look, we're working on this. Uh, we just need some more time for input and that should be held as, as, um, held as constitutionally valid. Uh, if there's no indication when your moratorium will end, the courts can inquire as to the constitutionality of the moratorium and they can set the time for you instead. Um, and that's from the case of Russo versus uh, New York State Department of Environmental mm -hmm. Conservation. And um, that case, there was a moratorium on the alteration of wetlands for over three years, and there was no indication on when it would end. So essentially, uh, the court said that it can't be unreasonable and ordered DEC to decide uh, set a date certain for um, the termination of the moratorium. So put an expiration on it. <laughs> and then variances from the moratorium. During your moratorium, it's common that the governing board will hear uh, the variances from the moratorium instead of the zoning board of appeals. But again, when they do that, you want to make sure that you're specifically stating uh, which statutes you plan to supersede uh, if the governing board is going to consider those variances. Um, especially because um, your governing board might also not be as well uh, versed in, <laughs> in variance laws to begin with anyway. As you are. Uh, so I think that one is one of those ones that I probably um, I probably wouldn't want to do, but I can mm -hmm. see why you would do that as well. But um, and again, you're just making sure that you're building um, some kind of relief mechanism into it so that somebody who's aggrieved by uh, the moratorium can go before for a variance themselves. So. And there's an important distinction here. The slide I did a little while ago on the attorney general with the attorney general's opinion about a 
moratorium on use variances being granted while zoning is being revised. That's different from this. This is variances from the moratorium itself. So the allowing of if there's a project that really wouldn't cause any harm and it kind of fits under the umbrella of that moratorium law to give it permission to go ahead, to give it a variance from the moratorium. And Paul is going to talk about one. Yeah, in fact, right uh, we have the Montgomery Group versus the town of Montgomery. And this was where the court held that a developer of an adult community should get a variance from the moratorium because they suffered an, an extraordinary hardship um, that the project itself wouldn't impact the health, safety, or general welfare of the community. And it will not substantially undermine the land use plan or revision uh, process that was under review. And that was, I believe they've been through the beginning of approvals and the town put it into play and it was, or put a moratorium in play. And it was because the moratorium also handled special use permits and site plan review, which is what the community was going before the board for. Um, and again, it was just, it was costing the developer so much money as they kept kind of dragging their heels on it. So um, essentially the court held that they should be able to go forward with the variance. And then I'm taking, I don't know why our it, it's that's an effect that somebody attached to it, and possibly and possibly it's its original author, who I'll tell you uh, that I'll tell you who that was after our session. But uh, the takings are does does everybody uh, does well? I'm not even going to bother asking the question. A taking is, and this is something we learned in planning school in our law class. It's a basis, it's kind of an academic discussion, and maybe some of you know what a regulatory taking is. What a regulatory taking means is when the local government takes more than its fair share. There, I, I had a planning teacher who used to say, they're winners and losers in planning. That was his line. They're always winners and losers. But when a law or a local government has such a, a restriction on a property that it's argued by the owner successfully in court that it's a regulatory taking and that the owner has to be compensated for that taking. So that happens once in a while. It's a hard thing. I mentioned it last night. The When there are subdivisions and there are lots created that are, are too small or difficult to develop, it's very hard, once the lot's created, if somebody buys the lot in order to build a house on it or do something else with it, for a permit not to be granted, for a local government to say, no, you can't develop that land. We subdivided it 20 years ago, but didn't subdivide it properly. Or the zoning changed and became uh, where there are now larger minimum lot sizes and somebody has a small minimum lot size, the Zoning Board of Appeals would be in a really difficult position not to grant an area variance to allow the development of that parcel. And that is because if somebody buys a parcel and is denied use of it, that's a regulatory taking. That's where the, the owner can't be, isn't given fair use of the property. And then can't sell it for anything either. So there have been arguments that moratorium laws represent regulatory takings. And the, the advantages, this, this goes back to our zoning board, our balancing test with, with area variances, right? The advantages, uh, the um, the impacts, the advantages to the community must weigh, outweigh the negative impact to the property owner in order for a moratorium law to be legitimate. Yes? Okay, so if you have a two acre lot where you can't build and someone buys a quarter lot, they bought that's self imposed. If they bought it, 
it's self-imposed, arguably, yes. Right, so if this lot was like a quarter acre or yeah. a half, one acre, but now the zoning laws have been two acres for years, and they bought that quarter lot, and they wanted to build there, you could rightfully say, no, you need two acres. You, you could make that argument, but it's harder, uh, especially if it was purchased before the zoning change. But yeah, let's say somebody bought the quarter, quarter acre lot and says, okay, now I want to build, and they don't have, uh, they're not allowed to because they don't have the minimum lot size. If it's, if it's that dramatic, if it's, if it's just like, if it's a small adjustment, then you're kind of yeah, hard-pressed to deny it. But if it's a quarter acre versus two, two acres, acres, that's a big one. And you pr you'd probably have to say to the, the property owner, um, and, and that's, you know, buyer beware. The, uh, the, the, the property owner, you, you'd have to say you have to increase the well, size of your lot. Well, if somebody owned that yeah. quarter lot before the zoning laws, then it's kind of grandfathered in. It's, it's harder, yeah. Right. I mean, it's not strictly grandfathered in, but I'm just giving, a, giving an example here. Right. Remember that quote. For every circumstance is, is different because there, there are laws that say there, there are people who try to get area variances when they don't have a big enough lot but they own the lot next door and there are laws that say if you own a separate lot and you own a non-conforming lot you have to make that lot conform so you can't say oh well I've got this the subdivision was granted, and even though I own both of them, I can sell this one now. No, some some savvy communities have right. said you have to make the lot conform. We had tons of quarter of your lot. Oh, really? Yes, tons. Yeah. And huh? You know, and then now, I don't know, 20 years ago, I think, or at least 10, is you have to have at least two acres, which mm -hmm. is reasonable. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Do. Are they owned by separate people, or do the same people own them? No, mostly separate. People. Okay, that's a challenge. Yeah, that is a challenge. Well, that's so that's something we're, we're, if you want to try to brainstorm about that, we'll we'll get together with <coughs> Frank and Cassandra and you guys, and and we can try to figure out a solution to that. But that's a that's a challenging one. You could pass the law that says any non-conforming lot has to be made conforming uh, by uh, adjacent <coughs> owners and. and extinguish some of those subdivisions by passing that law if the same person owns multiple lots. Right. Uh, but that's that's really the solution to that problem. So uh, maybe it's a good thing that I brought that up because that's that probably been a, been a, what was that? I was running the money for my question. Yeah, good, good. I, uh, it's, been a, it's been a cloud that's been hanging over your town. But in this one, the, anybody else at, at, at well, since we stopped, since we paused for the question, does anybody else have have anything? Yeah, yes. we, have, we have the same situation with a few of our, mm -hmm. but they were their existing lots before the before the coal was right, started right before. Still, yeah, I'm I'm I went to the homeowners and asked if they could rezone the area so we don't have to pull by our town mm -hmm. setbacks. Mm -hmm. They're really they're only 50 foot wide lots and our. Our side setbacks are 25 feet. Wow. <laughs> and how big are those lots? Are they well, the they're same? Well, they're not an acre. They're, they're an acre. They're not an acre. Oh, they're not an acre. No. Yeah, but they're, they're, they're really undevelopable. They, well, they, well they, yeah. they were all there before right. Before we started. Right. Going. Even even with health law and separation distance, they're undevelopable. And that's, you know, there are a lot of places, There there's still a number of towns in the state without subdivision or without subdivision site plan or zoning. And when when people say, well, we don't need zoning, we don't need subdivision regulations, stuff like that happens. And it's it's really, there there's an element that protects the buyer, the eventual buyer of the <coughs> land. And and that's why... Is why there is isolated? Yeah. Is there, I mean, could we, could the homeowners go in and get that area rezoned? Well, the town could, the town, the town has passed zoning for larger lots, and those who, if, if anybody owns adjacent lots, then they can combine those lots and make them bigger. That's the easiest thing to do. And then those who aren't willing to, maybe you can, con you can try to coordinate some of them to adjust their property lines, adjust their lot lines, and sell some, sell some land to fix the problem. 
yeah. was actually at the same house. Mm -hmm. It was actually happened. A number of them. They can't do nothing with it, so they'll let them go for uh, taxes. And oh! The county got smart. Sold them they'll, to the adjacent property. They won't sell one. They'll put oh. four or five together. Oh, that's good. They'll go ahead. And yeah. So, but this isn't uh, this isn't a town without zoning. Yeah. Right. So, oh, okay. So you don't have zoning, but they're undevelopable because you don't even have room for for uh, septic and, and wells. So, uh, okay, well, back to the slide, Charles versus Diamond. This had to do with a village that where there was a lack of sewage capacity, and the, um, the village held up approvals for a 36-unit apartment. It's the village of Camillus outside of Syracuse. And the village didn't upgrade the system. It just held, held up the approvals for this 30, proposed 36-unit apartment. It didn't change the zoning. It just said we can't approve it because we don't have an adequate sewer system. And eventually the um, the owner challenged it and the, the challenged the long-standing moratorium law and um, they the court said accused the village of attempting to avoid development without actual <coughs> legislation that says we don't want a 36-unit apartment building. They were doing what I they were doing uh, what I described earlier of kicking the can down the road and just hoping the developer would go away. But the developer uh, it, and the court found that the uh, the developer this was a taking by the the village of the developer and the actions were found the the moratorium law was found to be unreasonable. The bottom case came out when I was in planning school, and I remember a lot of talk about it, and it was determined by the United States Supreme Court that temporary takings that deny the landowner all use of their property, so these are temporary takings, it's admitted that it's a taking, that you can't use your property, it was a developer who wanted to, um, to build in the Lake Tahoe area where there's a regional planning group that protects the, the, the entire region, the entire uh, scenic uh, area there. Uh, that, that case said that moratoria are not categorically takings. A temporary taking is reasonable, the court said, um, and it was being shared by lots of other owners. Uh, it was being shared by the community at large and not just placed on a particular property owner. And it also said, the court said, that the many, par many parcels as a result of this moratorium law and the revision of the zoning in the area would result would have, in the end, more, would, they would be more valuable with better regulation. And that's, that's generally what we hope to be the case with all planning and, and all regulation. And the diminution, the diminution of value must be, ta must be tantamount to confiscation. And that line comes from Golden versus Ramapo. So that the, uh, the value has to be so low that it's the equivalent of an actual confiscation of the land, taking of the, the value. So temporary takings are permissible, thanks to that U.S. Supreme Court case. Vested rights are really the key. It's not, as Paula said, getting your application in that grandfathers you and enables you to say, okay, I'm, I'm good, I'm good to go, I can build this now, the moratorium doesn't, the new law doesn't apply to me, but vested rights, substantial construction and expenditures. And in the, I mentioned this case a little earlier, Pete Drown versus the town board of Ellenberg, and this is, this is one of those really surprising cases where the, this was the incinerator, the applicant had invested $850,000 in property and equipment for the incinerator. 
and the court said that they didn't have vested rights. So they had a lot of money invested, but the court said because the equipment can be sold, the land can be sold for fair market value, those aren't vested rights. So sometimes the establishment of that vested rights isn't as easy as it might seem. In steam heat versus Silva, the, there had been construction, but the court said it was so obviously temporary and flimsy and of impermanent materials that the court said it was not substantial. So in that case, the applicant just rushed to establish vested rights, but really didn't have them. And in the, in the top one here, um, Hasco Electric versus Dassler, moratorium may not, however, be used to stop building permit operations begun under a valid building permit in good faith to the extent the owner had secured vested rights. So this is kind of the textbook vested rights. And I gave that example in Zoning Board of Appeals overview when I mentioned the reversal, the uh, reversal of the decision if vested rights had been achieved in the rehearing slide. And um, in the, uh, the case on the bottom, I think a stop work order was placed on the building operation after um, a, a permit had been issued in anticipation of a moratorium in order to prevent the landowner from acquiring vested rights. So there are certain ones you, you can't stop um, and, uh, and should. The, this is uh, another reminder of the importance of procedure, and Paula mentioned the easiest way for a decision to be invalidated is not to send it to the county planning agency, even though the, uh, mor a moratorium law is a type 2 action for seeker. You don't have to worry about seeker. Just note in the record that it's a type 2 action. You do have to send it because it's usually for the entire municipality and it has to do with zoning. Send it to the county planning agency for comment. And they'll probably say, uh, they'll either recommend approval or they'll say this is a local issue and do whatever you, you want. We don't have any opinion on it. Um, or they might have a recommendation for how to do it for, for a slight improvement to it, uh, an informal recommendation. And we talked about how county planning may affect the vote. We, we can just skip that one. Oh, and I, uh, I was thinking we, um, we'd already gotten to this slide, and I, I just didn't remember it. I, I already addressed it for seeker purposes, moratoria, uh, two actions. No, uh, categorically determined, predetermined not to have a significant adverse effect on the environment, so you can just say so for the record. And Paula is going to wrap up with the last few slides on drafting moratorium law. So drafting your moratorium law, you want to, again, adopt it in the form of a local law that gets filed at the Department of State. For your existing zoning ordinance or local law, again, treat it as an amendment to that ordinance or local law, but make sure that you are following the procedural requirements when you're doing so. So notice, hearing, county referral, you want to make sure that you're going along with all of those things to make sure that you're strictly following those laws. <coughs> clearly define the activity affected. The moratorium should clearly define the activity affected and the manner in which it's effective. So questions like, does the moratorium affect construction itself? Or does it affect the issuance of permits? your permitting, uh, your building code or zoning enforcement officer is going to need to know that for, for their sake. Does it affect actions by boards or commissions within the municipality? Can projects uh, review continue or does it also have to be stopped? And if the moratorium supersedes any provision of town or village law, it has to be adopted by town or village law and they have to specifically <coughs> state which section of state law is being superseded. And that's especially important when um, you set up a variance process. If the variance <coughs> process is going to the town board or the village board, you want to make sure that you're being very clear about um, 
which which one of the state laws that you're superseding, and you'll be using your municipal home rule law uh, to do so. And then, of course, establish a valid public purpose for the moratorium with a preamble that recites the nature of the land use issue, uh, as well as the need for further development of the issue uh, in the comprehensive the community's comprehensive plan or in your current land use regulations. Um, make sure that you refer to the fact that time is needed to essentially take a break and be able to make um, good land use decisions from here without, so while, um, while halting development during that time. And then be sure to state that the moratorium is in effect for a specific time period. Again, ideally that's three to six months that can be uh, further extended if you need to. And include a relief mechanism that allows uh, burdened homeowners to apply for relief from the restrictions. And of course, again, make sure that you're clear about who will be handling uh, the variance procedure. And then finally, uh, with community growth comes development pressure. So you want to make sure that your comprehensive plan is adequate to deal with growth. But also not just growth, like if your community is constantly changing, your comprehensive plan should be reflecting that as well. I think you see a lot of communities in New York State that might be shrinking, and so that's also a time to go back and take a look at your comprehensive plan. I make sure that things like um, if solar is a problem in your community, you want to make sure that you're putting you know, a solar guide or your feelings about solar in that comprehensive plan. If you're seeing that a lot of people, homeowners, are leaving your municipality, you want to make sure that you're looking at your demographics. Who is staying in your community? Ask, your, ask the high schoolers in your community, do you plan on staying here after you, after you graduate? Mm -hmm. If you go to college, are you going to come back here afterwards? Because those are really important economic uh, you know, decisions that need to be made. and public officials need to know about so that um, you can keep kind of the health of your community going. Do you have a lot of aging people? Uh, do they want to stay in the community? What kind of services are needed to make sure that they're staying in your community and can age uh, safely um, as well as they can thrive in your community? Um, I'm trying to think of other ones off the top of my head that are coming to me, but I feel like housing, um, age issues, and like demographics are big ones to always keep in mind. Solar. The other thing about solar is if you're contemplating doing a moratorium or you don't have regulations about solar, there is, uh, NYSERDA has a uh, solar toolkit for municipalities along with a sample local law and while you're doing the solar you should also be aware of battery storage as well as part of these systems a lot of times that uh, kind of we have an aging power grid so uh, we're going to need more power like battery stored power for um, for some of these projects so there's actually a model law from NYSERDA about those issues as well. So that might be something if you're updating your solar, you might want to look at battery power as well. Uh, and your moratorium provides time to formulate a comprehensive regulatory approach. Again, you're just taking that time to, to take a breath and pause and say, okay, we have this issue before us, what are we going to do to address it? And precisely drafted moratoria or moratoriums should withstand legal challenges. And if your municipal attorney has questions, they can always reach out to our Office of General Counsel for their opinions as well or for their advice. Uh, so we always encourage that. And if you guys ever have questions, always feel free to reach out to us. If we can't get you the answer, we'll try to send you to somebody who can. And finally, that's where you can reach us. And you got four hours of training in three and a half hours, so good for you guys. Um, do, do any of you have any questions, rights, concerns? Three years. 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 Three
they can request it, but it should be the CDA is going to be the one that's going to be or not. Why were, why were both the